So Jamie, you and I recorded a conversation really recently, and it was really around what's happening in the psychedelic space, particularly around patents and around looking at the game theory of what happens when money enters the space. And one of the, it was very well received, but one of the pieces of feedback, which I think we both got was, okay, great job diagnosing the problem, but what are the solutions? Yeah. And that was just literally logistic. We ran out of time. Um, so I, th I think it's always, a, you know, it's critical to, you know, effectively sort of abrade the wound, you know, which is like if you, if you're a kid and you're skateboarding or you fall off your bike and you get a bunch of dirt and gravel in it, you know, your parent or your family physician is going to scrub the hell out of it to get it down to raw flesh which is really painful. And as a kid, you may be like, ah, you're hurting me. Why would you hurt me? You're supposed to be loving me or helping me. But it's like, no, 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 no. I promise this is better than a septic infection down the line. So there is some sense that we've got some dirt and gravel in the mix right now. And that actually the most compassionate thing we could possibly do is, is clean that wound. And that's kind of what we were doing where we were deconstructing things. Um, I think there are, you know, A, I wouldn't have just written a book about what I think is possible <laughs> on the other side of it. B, there's just, you know, tens of thousands of incredibly passionate, well-intentioned people as a part of this movement. So to just to honor and acknowledge all those, all those great intentions, and that's on, that's with researchers, therapists, and clinicians, entrepreneurs, you name it. There's a bunch of great people in this space. And just what are the ways to guide our way through? Because, you know, you, you and I, I think, um, I hadn't thought this one until the conversation we were just in uh, yesterday, um, where the thing I think is probably um, most subtly pernicious, I guess, uh, that we should all be aware of is that if folks are part of the quote unquote psychedelic renaissance or movement, and they're coming with good intention, and presumably they have some degree of being informed by the psychedelic experience themselves, or they wouldn't give a shit. And that, at least culturally at this moment, there are a lot of pro-social, pluralistic, humanistic values that are ascribed to said psychedelic initiatory experience. Then we get to express our concerns. We try to come together with all parties and actors because that's what groovy people do, right? And then we share our truths, which we understand are all relative and, and, you know, and, and context bound, et cetera. And then nothing ever gets figured out. And we end up in this kind of wishy squishy gray zone ambiguity of like, well, I guess maybe there's not a there there. Maybe everybody is trying their best. Maybe they said they really are going to do good things. So I guess we have to take them at their word because that's what trusting people do. And what you end up with is the ambiguity that then gets weaponized and exploited by bad faith actors who, again, just like Exxon, just like J. Philip Norris, just like any, you know, big tobacco, big oil, who were like, we're just going to play on ambiguity for a few decades and milk the system while everyone else is kind of wandering about what exactly happened. And so if there was a kick in the ass energy <laughs> to our first part of that conversation, it would be that. It would be like smack, smack, like, hey, sober up. This is a knife fight for all the marbles. <laughs> and, and to get back to that place of fuzzy, hazy, intersubjective, I thought there was something going on, but they swore and promised me it wasn't. And so it's that sense of being persuaded or stalled while the game theoretics just ratchet on to the point where suddenly you're tied up and don't have choices. That would be the thing that I would want to kind of carry over from our first conversation is let's really be aware of the stakes and let's really be aware of no choice is a choice. No decisive action is an action. And while those squishy choices and inactions are happening, other people are working feverishly behind the scenes with very directive strategies and agendas that are basically taking pieces off the board and reducing optionality downstream for more pro-social options. Uh, there's another thread I, I would love to cover that I think that links these conversations, which is game theory and is the idea of the games we're playing. So we all know and are familiar with the, the current game of um, uh, extractive capitalism. You know, we we are all familiar with that in some in some sense. I think what's exciting and what's quite psychedelic, really, is the concept of how to either play the game really differently or play a completely new game. Which for me has always been the essence and the promise of the psychedelic experience. You know, it's it's um, you know, and I think there's also other areas where it spans into. We focus a lot on the medicinal. 
there's also the the the, the ceremonial and the various ways that that looks um how that plays out there's the underground there's so many different mm-hmm. brands to it as well which might be fun to explore but it would be cool to to look at th- this this concept of the different games we could be playing and, mm-hmm. and maybe start at that yeah i mean you know obviously you can slice and dice this any way we want right but it, it, at least a way it occurs to me to think of it just based on what seems to be happening in the space is you have the finite game let's just say this is the pharmacological medical model with big pharma with venture capital with all the bits and pieces that we've you know kind of explored and you've got both you know cynical bad actors in that space which we kind of have flagged at least um, you know, at least as far as archetypes or, or potential, we haven't necessarily been calling folks out. But then there's also good actors within that finite game, incredibly good hearted people attempting to engage with market based solutions um, to get this healing out into the world. And, and I think one of the key things there is sort of like, okay, so if you're going to say we're not blowing up the entire macroeconomic system to try and reinvent something else as a vessel or a vehicle for psychedelic therapies to get into the world, so we're going to work with what we've got, that's really, that's plausible, that's reasonable, that's sane, it's pragmatic. And it's also time, you know, timely, it's efficient. Um, now, there are a few software patches Right. So rather than starting from scratch with a tabula rasa kind of thing, there are a few software patches that you can make. And the obvious ones are things like benefit corps. Like what do you, how do you incorporate and what are your terms of capital and investment and return? And so for anybody, I mean, most folks are deeply familiar with benefit corps at this pop, you know, at this point, but just that idea of, hey, we put into our operating agreements and our shareholder agreements and our governance structures something other than bottom line shareholder fiduciary responsibility. And we add in environment, communities, you know, employees, stakeholders, the kind of stakeholder model. So people, profit, planets, whatever, fill in the blank on those, but something that actually at the inception or instantiation of the organization or in the reception of capital and the establishment of governance, you bake that in. And and a really good example of that, that's that, um, I just continually find useful. Um, one of our friends is uh, one of the partners at Greylock Ventures uh, in Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road, one of the biggest ones. Reed Hoffman is a partner there from LinkedIn, um, as well as others. And they stood up something called the Brain Mind Conference um, at Stanford and Harvard and MIT. And one in four, one in four papers presented um, at that conference were about ketamine therapy and psychedelic therapies. And their general premise at Greylock was to say, hey, we believe that, you know, most funds look for 10x returns, and, and but they know that nine out of nine out of 10 of their babies die. They're, you know, they die in the crib, they don't launch. So you're good money after bad, but one in 10 hits and they have to have a 10x return to cover your spread on the rest of the portfolio. What that does though, is that leaves all sorts of pro-social and important innovations um, and research underfunded, even though it ought to be in the world. So they articulated this space of the one to three X return. And that sense of like, you can think about it like, you know, like ever like self replenishing philanthropy. You can think of it as C- CSR, called corporate social responsibility. You can think of it in, in a bunch of different buckets, but basically our fiduciary commitment as an organization, which prevents a lot of those market dynamics, creating shitty outcomes is to say, we want to give you your money back. We want you to invest in us, give us rocket fuel to get to lift off. Once we have it, we, we can then become self-perpetuating. So instead of a black tie gala dinner every year where you get hit up for another check to replenish the leaky bucket of a do-gooder nonprofit that can't stand on its own feet, you get to either double down on us because you're like, hey, these guys are getting traction and we want to continue adding fuel to that, or you take your money back out and redeploy it. And then a cap of 3x return which is to say, hey, this is a pro-social benefit mission. We don't want to ha- over-harvest, right? Therefore, what, you know, once what, three times return, pretty damn good money. You know, like most people would sign up for that, especially in this age of artificially depressed interest rates on all other, you know, a whole bunch of other uh, asset classes, you know, and can we play that game? You know, and, th- and then another one is potentially the notion of reverse tithing, where with this, this is not dissimilar to the one to three X, but it's to say, hey, if what we're building is a network-based economy, 
right? The, in the sense that user generated content, user contribution, you could think of Facebook and YouTube as, you know, dot one <laughs> examples of this, but like, wait, all those guys did was build a software pattern. It's the bajillions of people filming and uploading their content that creates the value in that ecosystem. So the notion of reverse tithing for capital could be, hey, if what we're building is a meshwork ecosystem, of humans right, doing things together and that the really the, the exponential value comes from the entire network, then we pledge never to extract more than 10% of net profits out of that system because otherwise that's siphoning. It's like constantly chopping down a forest instead of letting the entire thing grow together and stitch together. So those kind of notions, one to three X return, benefit corpse or other forms of legal structures and entity structures, and in and socializing and then delivering on some version of reverse tithing. I would see those as all possible software patches that allow well-intentioned actors not to get hijacked by the market dynamics, by the kind of game theory of the finite market game everybody's playing. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning, doing a few shout outs to people who are doing that. So there's the, the North Star Pledge, um, who are working very hard to create an ethics pledge that, that may well go into, for example, shareholder agreements, et cetera. Um, I think that's a, you know, I think it's an interesting area. There's also the, um, there's organizations that are trying to do that in other areas, you know, trying to create some kind of a system of checks and balances in the ceremonial spaces, like uh, one is mm. called Guild of Guides, for example. You know, so there, there are things happening in the community and, you know, IP defense funds as well are forming. That's what Tim Ferriss was asking. Is anyone doing this? I, I just spoke to Graham Pachenik, the I, psychedelic IP lawyer, uh, who first kind of broke the story of, of Compass Pathways' most recent uh, patent application. And he was talking about the, the very simple things you can do, like, for example, creating enough information for patent officers. It was actually quite interesting. He was talking about how patent officers have like three hours per patent application, and they're meant to put themselves in the, in the mindset of, okay, what is this industry and where, where the, where's this application coming from? But um, they don't know about psychedelic research. Uh, you know, so it's, and so there's an education job to be done. So I think there are simple processes that can be done right now within the game that people are doing. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's really worth mentioning. However, there, there are also, it's a very tricky field to navigate. This has always been the conversation I have with, with Kat Knorr, North Star and, and others involved in that. It's like, yes, but uh, it sure. is, there are other players who are bigger, stronger, and faster than a B Corp might be. It's, it's a tricky thing to, to be competitive in a different way in a hyper-competitive environment. So yes. I'm yes. curious, what the response to that might be. What's what's the response we could have to that? Take it to the next Yeah, one. I mean, the bottom line when you're saying, hey, more cynical, better resource folks with legal teams on retainer and all that kind of thing, they can just do slap suits. So, you know, strategic lawsuits against public participation, which is just, we will just, we'll just gunge up you silly little nonprofit with barely two nickels to rub together and we will just outlast you. We will just bury you in litigation and drag this out for years. And again, back to the notion of the passage of time is a competitive advantage. Like ambiguity over time allows decisive actors to keep acting. So they don't actually have to win the day. They don't actually have to persuade anybody of anything. <laughs> All they have to do is keep it uncertain while they still, while they still strip mine. Right. So there is that. Now, you already hinted at it with IP and some of those elements. Um, and actually, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, that many folks on your channel um, are familiar with, um, he said something which I, which I think is probably, you know, probably holds up, which is the idea that if you want to start transitioning out of rivalrous games or finite games, you kind of actually have to win the last round of that and then call the new game. Right, it's like this is not five card stud anymore. Jokers aren't wild, and here's the deal: we're all going to play, and we're all going to get along. Right, but you actually have to paradoxically win at the game you've determined is anathema, so that you are then a position of, of of optionality. And and this was a couple of years ago, maybe maybe only eighteen months ago, but this was actually when North Star was first ginning things up. And Bob Jesse, who was another member of the old guard of the psychedelic community in the Bay Area, had already taken a crack at a pledge. And this is probably now, I suppose, two or even three years ago, had had folks sign it. And what was interesting there was you had good actors 
opting not to sign it for specific and principled reasons, but you also had bad actors opting to sign it, right? And kind of sneaking in under the church tent. So the enforceability was zilch, you know, um, optics were muddied. And, and that was my, you know, that's been my first filter with North Star and, and others, which is, is, does this actually filter out? Good and good and bad actors, and is it in any way? Does it have any teeth or penalty for defection? Right. So, so, and and that was, um, and then I asked, you know, Daniel's and, and our mutual friend Jordan Hall. I was like, okay, so do you run, let me run this past you. Give me your game theory assessment, and his his sort of you know Mr. Spock mentat assessment. He was like brr, brr, ran all the million probabilities and was like, okay, here's the deal. This is what you need to do. You actually need to steer into this kid. You can't say, hey, it's psychedelics are groovy. Let's create a new kumbaya economy. There, you know, anything that can be weaponized in a game theoretic construct will be. So beat them to the weapons cache, right? And get in there and patent the living shit out of everything. Right, because that is ultimately the end game here. Is you know, this is Warren Buffett 101: build castles and moats. Right, build high ground that is defensible and make it hard for anybody else to get up there. Right, and Peter Thiel, who is a backer of Compass, you know, famously said in his own book, you know, competition is overrated, monopolies are where it's at. So we ought to expect that. And you, you can you can have pledges, you can do all the things. Just that the the push of capital will get us to that place willy nilly. So, so a thought here, and this is, this is goes from good actors doing their level best inside the finite game. And, you know, by the way, there's companies like Patagonia, there's lots of social benefit companies that have done amazing things inside the economic system with intentional software patches. They're saying, we're not going to play the race to the bottom game. We're going to play the best possible version within this structure. So that's absolutely possible. The culture jamming ones are things like, you know, if you if you take a look at all the players in the space, give them more of what they want. Don't try and persuade them that they're wrong or bad for wanting what they want, right? So if you look at researchers, what do researchers want? Researchers want high quality data that they can assess and analyze and then publish in peer reviewed journals to get tenure. That's what they want, right? What do entrepreneurs want? Entrepreneurs want capital to launch their dream and vision. What do therapists and people in the helping professions gather around this? They want clients. They want a pipeline of people that they can help and serve, right? So you're like, okay. And, and then what do investors want? Particularly in this space, some form of impact investing, they want integrity. They don't want to be taken for a fool. They don't want there, there to be good money after bad. They want to see positive ethical impact aligned with their values. So you're like, okay, fantastic. So now we've got the landscape. Let's give everybody what they want. Right. And let's create a confederacy. And the key here, I think, is is two. One is everyone who's a signatory gains access to the aggregate network effects of that platform. Right. So like the UN, like you don't have to belong to the UN. If you want to be in North Korea, if you want to be in Iran, you can do that. hundred percent. You just don't have access to, and granted, it's a muddy record in the last 12 months, but you don't have access to global public health data. You don't have access to favored loans. You don't have access to be a signatory on mutual defense treaties right? Or open borders or trade agreements, right? So, so you can play outside the network if you want. It's 100% optional. However, the aggregate network effects are compelling enough to entice people to come into it. So rather than enforcement, you want to have attraction, right? So because enforcement will always lose against better resource, more cynical players, right? But if you have a positive network effect of, hey, we are a confederacy, this is the psychedelic confederacy, right? Representing all the stakeholders and the signatories agree to share data. So amazing. I don't have to be paying grad students 25 bucks an hour to try and get this tiny little N sample size. You know, I actually have hundreds or thousands or millions of bits of data to play with now. Amazing. I'm in, you know, and, and I will agree to reciprocate like Linux or an open source software community. The, the investors are like, great. I have people that I know aren't going to cynically exploit this, create bad PR, blowback from my family office or venture fund or whatever it would be. So that's awesome. But if you have aggregate media marketing, ad spend and storytelling so that you can, you know, and you have a directory like, hey, find a psychedelic alliance you know, therapist in your town, t punch in your zip code and here's the three people that are there. You can start directing clients 
to those folks, right? So it's, it's, you start seeing how that could work. And I think the keys there would be researchers committing to open source data sharing, you know, for people within the Alliance and, you know, say the top 10 most visible investors committing to say, we're actually not going to fund any shadier shit than this. Like this is our, this, this is our ISO 9000, you know, this is our certification level in order to be eligible for investment. And granted, there's going to be sovereign wealth funds. There's going to be, you know, Bitcoin bros. There's going to be folks that do the end runs. Absolutely. But you just build the system on positive attraction to steer into the skid of all the market dynamics. And then, oh, by the way, we, we, you know, we flooded the zone with a very aggressive and creative IP strategy such that all of them are now open source creative commons, provided you don't do any of the smash and grabs and extract value out of the system. So something comparable to like a creative commons license where like, hey, feel free to use it, share it, distribute it, but name check it and cite it and don't turn a buck on it. Yeah, yeah I really like that. And it's something I've been mulling over a lot, thinking about something like the North Star Pledge and how to give it teeth effectively. And those teeth can be through cultural pressure and they can be through, cool, through like you said, through an attractor, you know, like a, a, a positive. And, you know, it, it just struck me as you were talking that what we could really use in the community coming together is people who are good at gaming and good at governance. Because it strikes me that once you create that thing, you need to be really, you also use the word creativity, which I think is, is the key. You've got to be really creative of how to make that anti-fragile so that it can't be taken over from the inside. So that a, a pharma company can't go to the five most influential people in it and go, hey guys, how do you expect to make a million bucks to do this? All right? So trying to, that's why I think people who are good at game design, it's like, okay, well, how, what would we do in that situation? And I think that's where there's, that's where for me, the North Star Pledge, although I know they are aware of this and they consider it, it's not that they're not aware, that's where it falls short a bit for me. Because I think starting, and this goes back to something we were saying earlier, when, when the US Constitution was put together, which is, you know, I think another great example of creating a system of checks and balances, which is imperfect, but a hell of an achievement at the time as well, they had a they had something to define themselves against. It was like, oh, because what happens if you don't do this? Tyranny. That's what happens. Oh, okay, you've got to avoid, it's like avoiding the bad guy in a video game. What I've noticed is that there is an assumption that no one is really uh, tyrannical. Everyone is coming from the right place ultimately, and maybe they're wounded. And, you know, you mentioned this before. And so I'd be really curious to say, okay, look, if we could just play with it and just assume that tyranny is the thing we are trying to avoid, where are the most psychedelically thinking people in governance who could go, okay, here's a system of checks and balances. Here's an anti-fragile network that, that really works and it can have these outputs. And the people who are um, really expert in gaming as well, like that I would love to see. I would love to see people gathering together to do that and have some fun with it. <laughs> Funny, you should mention that we're launching an, an infinite alternate reality game based on stochastic <laughs> Gnosticism. So like, how do we, we didn't say blow yourself to God consciousness. We just kind of pointed, signposted it and made it really fun and showed you how. So yeah, so I think that ultimately that trickster element right? The notion of play, the notion of human spirit, creativity, all of those things is, is vital and essential. And, and I think, you know, you just, you just pointed out something which, you know, I don't want to belabor, but in no way do I want us to skip it because even, um, yeah, a mutual friend of ours, a thoughtful fella had basically just shared with me lately. He's like, I just got burned really badly on a critical project that they were doing. And he said, he said, I think it's because my, my shadow, my assumption has always been, we said like people are wounded, they might do, they might act out a little bit, but really they're all capable of wholeness and love and acceptance and let's keep going on that one. He's like, actually, no, like just because I've glimpsed someone's whole self, full self, true self, fill in the blank, whatever construct you want to use means, you know, it's, it's like George Bush being like, I looked into Putin's eyes and I saw his soul. It's like, like hell you did, buddy, <laughs> right? He was wearing contacts, right? So, um, so that notion where we can, we can engage in psychedelic idealism and naivety, which is just because someone in the afterglow of an immediate psychedelic experience or someone recounting a profoundly vulnerable, like weaponized vulnerability, right? Which I think you guys have been describing and exploring on your channel. Like just because those strings get pulled does not mean this person is going to make ethical decisions 
downstream. And that that leads us back into the fuzzy ambiguity space. So let's just kind of pow, 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 get really sober and understand that in fact, sometimes delicate, tender, numinous things are worth protecting fiercely. by anybody who sells you a persuasive enough story and plucks at your heartstrings, right? True compassion can be a, a keen blade that takes your head off in one cut versus a dull ax. So it's like, let's, let's definitely not get hoodwinked by the squishiness, the softening of boundaries of the psychedelic experience and the utopianism and idealism of it to miss what is actually potentially happening. So, so on that, so, so we've got Good, good folks in, inside the finite game making occasional software patches to help it run a little better and avoid the, the slippery slopes. So that's fantastic. We've got folks potentially culture jamming the finite game. Like let's steer into all those skids. Let's not try and claim the higher ground. Let's actually beat them to the bottom. Set up camp, establish it there, and then give it away. Turn it into an aid, turn it into an aid camp, right? <laughs> Instead of a high, condo high rise, right? Let's do that. And then the next one, and I think this is now we're kind of setting aside the, the focal point of much of the current conversation and actually panning way back, you know, back centuries, back millennia. Like, what are we actually talking about here? Right. You know, we, we're, we're so locked into the medical pharmacological model right now. And I think you said this, uh, it, I, I laughed uh, when you said this yesterday about sort of everyone's almost made a gentleman's agreement not to talk about the weird shit. You know, we're all going to be buttoned down and professional and, and everyone's going to be talking about clinical outcomes and, and depression and anxiety and all the, you know, all the metrics and no one's going to be like, it's like Hunter Thompson and in, in fear and loathing. Like, like, you know, when are we going to tell the poor bastard about the bats, <laughs> you know? And, and so my deepest hope, right, for the psychedelic renaissance, like to be super clear, we are without a doubt you know, we thought we were getting the age of Aquarius, we're going to get Prozac Nation 2.0. That is absolutely going to happen, but that's not all that's going to happen, right? That's the, that's the part, like that's where the hope comes in, right? So you're like, yep, that's a, that's a fucking lock. Uh, and, and, it, and it will break your heart if you, if you dwell on it too long, but it's only a slice of the pie. And we look at how this has always gone always <laughs> forever. And it's always been this battle between the priests and the Prometheans. Right, there's always been the light bringers to civilization, emphasizing human liberation and consciousness, and there's always been the middlemen and bureaucrats looking to lock it down. Right, so for for ages it was priests, you know, black cassocks. Then it became the shiny, the men in the shiny black suits. Right, it became the kind of the G-men, and it became Project MK Ultra and all these kind of things. And now it's in the men in the Savile Row suits, right, or hoodies and allbirds, right? It's, it's it's venture capital and it's the corporate element. So you, but we've always had this battle, and somehow um, the light has persisted. So you know the places where. Um, it seems, in fact, I'll, I'll even, uh, I just, I wrote a section on this, but this is, this is one that, um, you know, talking about why it's so critical that we actually open source all of this psychotechnology, right? So this is from my new book, Recapture the Rapture, but it's specifically, I wrote it with the presumption that the psychedelic renaissance, as we're currently describing it in its current market-based form, will be captured. So what, <laughs> right? Let's build the solution that's anti-fragile. And some, some folks have probably heard this passage by now, but this was actually one of uh, Richard Nixon's um, co-conspirators. He was indicted for Watergate, but on his deathbed, he gave an interview and he, and, you know, to Harper's and he finally kind of copped to what was going on. Because, you know, the priests and Prometheans, right, every single ecstatic community from Shaiva Tantra to Sufis to Quakers and Shakers, they've always been to Gnostic Christians, you name it, right, have always been repressed and shut down. The psychedelic community is arguably just one subset of that, of ecstatic liberatory communities, right? With, with a pro-social project. And, and so this is, this, this, is the, this is the passage. It's not just spiritual communities who've experienced this repression. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Richard Nixon's administration deliberately suppressed that era's move towards social justice by criminalizing the drugs that activists favored. Near the end of his life, John Ehrlichman, the Watergate co-conspirator, admitted to a journalist at Harper's, 
We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and psychedelics and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. The counter to this predictable suppression of transformational movements is simple. Widely share recipes that enhance individual and communal sovereignty using ingredients that are easily accessible. Distribute the human-centered design toolkit far and wide so it cannot be censored or suppressed. In other words, make it open source and scalable. Make these tools a perpetual part of the commons. Share the cheat codes to the infinite game. Democratize transcendence. Don't try and lead a revolution. Seed a revolution. Right? And so that leads us to kind of the underground and to sacramental use. Mm. And in this case, most sacramental use is underground, right? There are, there are you know, exceptions like Santo Daime, Udeve, uh, Native American church, those kind of elements. And, and, you know, for good and bad, they're syncretic. They're almost all a mashup of religi religious beliefs, some indigenous, some uh, Christian, Catholic, various other overlays. That is both the backbone of their meaning making for their community, and it's also problematic for others to come into. So in the sense of like, well, wait, if I really value the ineffable experience that those compounds sacramentally rendered deliver, do I actually have to buy off lock, stock and barrel on your entire interpretive framework? Right? So that's a little, it's not quite postmodern, right? <laughs> these, these are, you got to drink our Kool-Aid, right? To, to see our, to see our gods. Um, but the notion of the underground space, and you can take a look at something, you know, obviously Burning Man is a, is a vibrant global example what is what is sort of post postmodern psychedelic um meta spirituality and ritual look like mm. i'd love to explore that what struck me from what you were just reading um from recapture the rapture is that there's something there's something humble about an approach that mimics nature where you have the real stuff happening underground like the mycelium <laughs> <laughs> and the mushroom itself is really just the, the, the top expression of it, and the sex organ, right? To spread it in a, in a, in a further. But, you know, that, that point I was making in, in the, the Clubhouse talk yesterday about everyone having to kind of pretend not to be weird until we get this thing done. I think we lost, I think we threw a baby out with the bathwater there, because I think by throwing away that weirdness, you actually throw away your ability to manifest that as well. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of balance to be struck, I think. And what is often unspoken is that there's a huge history of underground use by underground therapists. There's indigenous use. There's combinations of, of all of those things. And they have, you know, it's a dangerous place for sure. I've, ex I've been, had many experiences in, in spaces like that, which I think were not well held. There's no accountability for people. There's a lot of narcissists. Um, it attracts Wait, vulnerable you're, you're speaking specifically of the underground. Yeah. The underground. Yeah, the underground. However, there's also amazing work being done. And this is why I think it's it's an interesting thing to explore because I know you've done a lot of work around this, like how to spot a cult. You gave a, a talk here in London with us where that, that was part of it. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's a lot of education required to ha help people understand how to navigate those ceremonial spaces, how to engage with that kind of deep way of knowing that isn't the, the kind of um, the clinical side of it. What are your thoughts on the, on the role of ceremony and the role of indigenous practices and ceremonial spaces in the next five, 10 years as, um, as this develops? Ooh, that's a doozy. Um, <laughs> I mean, gosh, I, I can only speak for myself, right? In the sense that, I don't feel comfortable, like unless I was going to change my life, go and deeply apprentice with a, an indigenous community, and then be, you know, and then use my advantage platform voice as a Westerner, et cetera, et cetera, actively to support, defend, and protect them. Um, 
I wouldn't go near it. You know, I, I by all means support their efforts, but the notion of like the last possible gasp of colonialism as we've hollowed out our lives and feel empty is to go and siphon what's remaining out of, you know, cultures in crisis that we played a, you know, half a millennium role in feels egregious. And the romanticization, the noble savage, like like all the old tropes are just getting dusted off and sprinkled with psychedelic pixie dust again. You know, and you're just like, hey, just let's just slow the fuck down and not do any of the dumbass stuff, you know, that we have done in the past. So as far as indigenous traditions, I think it's 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 deep listening and support of what they actually want, not what we think we need. And by all means, let's do that. And we should have been doing that all along. And and you know, and 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 absolutely any and all resources towards that. Um, as far as, but I I don't feel comfortable having an uh, a methodology or a cosmology imprinted onto my interior experience that I that isn't congruent to me and makes sense. And I and I think that there is something really possible these days to create a post-conventional metaphysics, meaning that you, you know, we can start establishing tools for navigating these spaces that don't collapse the waveform into false certainty, but still let us navigate well. <laughs> you know, because the, the you know, most people are like, well, you, you know, either I get the apophenia, I get the huge dopamine squared, I get the manic inflation, and I'm absolutely certain that what I glimpsed is the whole thing, and that I am a special and privileged carrier of that information. You know, or you can just kind of end up in multi-perspectival nihilism, you know, and just be like one of those, you know, 20 something DMT bros who's just launching themselves into hyperspace and just kind of collecting trinkets and baubles and, you know, McKenna mashup videos, you know, so there is a way through it, I think. And it just, you know, to me, the best analogy is the equivalent of like navigating in a whiteout in the mountains, mm -hmm. you know, like when you don't have, when you no longer have clear landmarks, you don't just give up and wander off. You actually become really, really precise about your bearings. And it might even get so sketchy that you actually have to have a partner walk out until you almost can't see them, shoot your compass bearing to them, walk to them, have them go out and repeat the process, right? So that you can actually stay, you know, on, on your bearing and not get lost. And to me, there's there's four, sort of four easy buckets of disqualifying people, and I think we're kind of all doing this intuitively in some way. Like the first for a novice user is it's not about you and it's not about now. So if somebody comes back hair on fire and saying it's all about me and it's all happening right now, you're like, yep, you're overcooked, right? That's kind of like you know like uh, the sort of bunny slope version. But then when you end up with whatever we would call them, adepts you know, psychedelic influencers, God forbid that that term even exists, right? Um, the next one that the ones I definitely check for is reality tunnel and grabbing the ring. So which, which are kind of, ex, you know, further expressions of the first two, which is, wait, you're going to a place and it's mediated by language, culture, personality, selfhood, genetics, epigenetics, your own particular proclivities. You see what you see right? But you've actually now become convinced that what that reality tunnel that you've been exploring is all of reality. So if you've missed the meta perspectival move, you're fucked. It does, I don't care how beautiful your reality tunnel is. If you've lost perspective that you're in one, right? Your, your, your assumptions and directions are going to be suspect over time. And then the final one is, is you know, I am a golden god. Are you not entertained? Right, someone who has taken that light and claimed it, you know, and and the playful way we've been describing that is, you know, the the the, the ring in in Tolkien, right, which is it's incredibly potent, but anybody who presumes that they are pure enough of heart or noble enough of cause to wield it by themselves, it will be bent by it, you know, versus a fellowship where you're like, okay, none of us can handle this. Right, but together we can bound it and potentially, you know, mitigate its damage and 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 maximize its impact. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and it, it this is another area I think that the community really needs to grapple with, and we need to find a healthy solution to. And so, it is not really possible, in my experience, to so radically change your cognitive grammar 
from the language you use to the influence of Christianity, all the things that make us who we are, even though we're not aware of it, to suddenly be like, no, now I'm running Shipibo Shamanism 2.0, and I see the world through that lens. It doesn't work in my experience. And so what a lot of people are talking about in the kind of, you know, the future of the ceremonial space is, okay, well, what is it? what does it look like to have our own ceremonies in different parts of the world, to have our own rituals, to not borrow them from somebody else, kind of steal them from somebody else, arguably. So I'm curious about that as well. And, and, and you know, you know, you, you, you run um, retreats yourself, you know, uh, getting people into deep states of flow. So you, you, um, you know that, that there are ways to create that. I think you've termed it communitas, that deep sense of belonging and, and connection. Um, so do you think there is some, hope for us developing our own ceremonial approaches to psychedelics in the West that don't rely on going, oh, that looks nice. I'll, I'll pick your world. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, literally, um, and this is, this is also another realm that's outside the medical pharma, pharma model, mm-hmm. but something, you know, and, and ways that this may work and persist yet, right. Which is effect- effectively the virtualization of things, right. I think Peter Diamandis, Ray Kurzweil, those guys, you know, it feels somewhat dated right now because it's sort of back in the heady days of Silicon Valley optimism. But but that idea of like, hey, my phone ate my TomTom Tom GPS, ate my address book, ate my camera, ate my um, iPod, it ate all these things. And now it's just zeros and ones in this singular device, right? And so in a similar way, we're seeing the virtualization of the psychedelic initiatory experience. And right? so even completely randomly. I mean, this is just people coming up to me and telling me. So this is not an exhaustive survey, but I think, you know, we've been tracking at least a couple of dozen smart tech startups that sprang from people reading Stealing Fire. You're like, whoa, that's crazy. And and all of them are technological, like Trip and Immersive VR, Dave, Dave Rabin's uh, Apollo Neuroband, like all kinds of things where people are like, wait a second, now because of the psychedelic experience and because of the reliability of precipitating a certain known interior interiority on demand, kind of Oliver Sacks 101, right? Drugs prom- drugs are a shortcut. They promise transcendence on demand. Well, they also promise measurement in, in easy, in easy bite-sized chunks, right? So we have kind of cracked the code on what are the mechanisms of action underneath the numinous experience, right? And as a result, we can now instantiate that across technology, psychology, pharmacology, right? Biology, measure, you know, all the different things. So that, so, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, right? I mean, Leary was trumpeting this back in the early nineties that the internet is kind of the new psychedelics, et cetera, but it's, it's a continued progression. And we really are having lots of different ways in. And so when it really comes down to it, and I mean, I, and I, and I write this in the book, but it's, it's kind of crazy. Like I was just, I don't think it's ever been laid out this way. But like, here's the recipe for all death, rebirth, written initiatory practices across time and space that are the seedbed of human civilization, consciousness, culture, art, philosophy, and religion and technology. You're like, okay, so super juice, dopamine, endorphins, nitric oxide in your body, boost vagal nerve tone and endocannabinoid tone, shift your neuroelectric state out of beta down into alpha, theta, potentially dipping down into delta with the occasional burst of gamma, do a global system reset of your cranial nerves via a pattern interrupt at your brainstem level, which you can do via electrical stimulation, nitrous oxide, ketamine, 5-MeO-DMT or anything else, which creates pan-hemispheric delta wave states. You know, if you've seen radar plots of the recent 5-MEO studies, Carl Dyseroth at Stanford has just done this with optogenetics in mice, but he's also done it with epileptic human patients. And he's done ketamine studies that create dissociative out-of-body experiences, realized that was three hertz EEG in certain locations in the brain, so delta wave states, then gone back without the ketamine, neuroelectrically stimulated three hertz, and wouldn't you know it, they have the same dissociative out-of-body experience. You know, the anesthesiologists at MIT have just done the same thing with nitrous oxide and realized, oh shit, for three to 12 minutes after inhalation of 50%, 50% oxygen, nitrous oxide blend, you will drop into a double amplitude delta wave state after which it normalizes and goes away which was the seedbeds of William James's varieties of religious experience, as well as Winston Churchill's profound reveries. And you're like, oh shit, okay, I think we've got this going. And then, oh, by the way, pulse your nervous system with energy. It could be AC, DC, it could be electrical, vibratory, acoustic, you know, acoustic, sonic. It could be pain, it could be orgasm, just neurological stimulation through that system. Boom, hit it, send it. 
and and then people spend as long as their neurophysiology can hold in that state of superordinate information richness which is epiphanic which because it was so rare back in the day some motherfucker would come down from the mountain and go hey guys hair on fire tell you what i'm gonna found a religion and everyone's like okay we'll take your word for it right and so now we can actually you know the virtualization of the psychedelic experience those are the cheat codes they fucking work you know go conduct the experiment and because now it is simply an evidentiary protocol that's falsifiable your n equals one your mileage will vary we can hold back from fetishizing reifying deifying the interior experience so it basically turns four thousand years of religiosity on its head you're like let the mystery stay the mystery right let's just get there see what's what and so you can literally say hey human if you want to conduct this protocol, here's how. Now, you can believe what you want to believe, right? You can believe what you want. You can skin this with whatever interpretive frameworks are congruent and true and helpful and culturally and personally relevant, appropriate and, and, and applicable. Um, you can have a theistic interpretation. You can meet the gods and angels of your pantheon. You can have an aesthetic orientation. You can say, wow, look at the fractal symmetries of my mind's eye. You can have an agnostic interpretation. Like it's super fucking interesting, but I'm not, I'm going to hold back on any definitive statements or full stops, right? So there's room for all of it, right? This is actually the neurophysiology of it. In which case the question then becomes, I think the ultimate one, which is back to Hunter Thompson and the bats, which is what on earth do we think is actually fucking going on out there? Right? What is this? What is what are our provisional? You know, what is our provisional assessments and assumptions about the non ordinary states of consciousness and the supraordinate amount of information that appears to be highly generative? You know, massively uh, creative, innovative. If you look back to the Greeks, it's the Muses. You look to Buckminster Fuller; he called it the design realm. Irvin Laszlo called it the Akashic field or the A field. Right? Plato called it the realm of ideal forms. You know, it's been around forever. Where people routinely say, uh, "Yeah, uh, that wasn't me." Um, super interesting, fully formed, totally badass thought. I've spent the next year or the rest of my career trying to track down and unpack, you're like, hmm, shouldn't we be actually checking that out? Because to me, that's so far up and above and beyond the specific mechanics of market-based pharmacological therapy and infinitely more interesting and gives us many, many more options and choices as to how to play, how to protect it, how to preserve it, how to translate it, how to transform it, and actually even how to potentially harness it. So that we can do all the good things that the psychedelic renaissance is predicated on, but we shouldn't get fixated on the specific mechanisms of action. You know, it's, it's a sort of, it's almost a material reductionism, which is baffling given the fundamental nature of the psychedelic experience itself. Fascinating. I, I would love to try some of that. Um, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It, that's a very sophisticated way of, of, Let's say, I mean, it's interesting. It's reduced, it's reducing it, but it's also democratizing it in some way. It's freeing it in some ways, the sense I get, right? It's normying it. When I hear about smart tech, you know, like put this headband on and you'll get into a same state of meditation as a Tibetan Lama, I'm like, okay, that's a state, not a stage of development. You know, this is something that comes from integral studies that I find very useful. We can all experience a state. Just press the right buttons, prod the right neurons. We can all enter a um, a state of consciousness, but we always interpret that state based on our cultural framework. And we don't, and this is coming up a lot in, in the psychedelic, uh, you know, in the clinical side of psychedelics, we don't have a, a robust cultural framework. We don't know why we're here as a culture. That's the meaning crisis, right? We don't really know why, what we're doing or why we should do anything. We're, so we're falling into either nihilism or narcissism, swinging back and forth. Um, so my only concern is the, the, possibility for people to become addicted to states and state chasing and okay. instead of then applying you know zen is full of you know so many of the mystery traditions got this or get this and they said you know i love there's a zen koan where someone's like what is the true nature of buddha and the master's like a sack of shit and it's like whoa like right back down to the mundane because applying all of that state insight into how to how to navigate a long-term relationship how to pay your taxes on time, how to be a member of the community feels really important. Yeah, 100%. 
And so as you're describing that, the the numinous state experience isn't the hard part. Right. If somebody has been in a locked down monophasic consciousness or awareness and cultural, they've been in a reality tunnel of like waking state muggle, then they have a psychedelic experience and they're like, holy shit, there's capital M more out here. This is amazing. This is game changing. And that's where you get all the upticks and this and the promises of being miracle cures and, and, and this has changed my life, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're like, okay, well, all that capital M more still irreversibly contains the human condition within it. And you do still have to figure out how to make rent. And you do still figure out how to raise your kids and be in a long-term relationship and have a career that is meaningful to you and doesn't suck your soul and stay open to the grief and complexity and challenges of the human world and experience and everything else going on. Like it's all still in there. I just now also have to figure out what the fuck's up with those bats, right? And so now like my, my, my existential load is much, much higher which actually can then can then create even more disruption and disturbance or perturbance. And then people can be like, okay, I can't handle all this stuff down here, but I've now got the cheat codes to go back up there. So I'm going to spend lots more time bypassing the hard, messy, weak link, which is just this mortal coil to go back and be entranced by the fairy lights. And your description of like, hey, it's just a state and we're creating all of this tech and, you know, Neuralink and implants and God consciousness or orgasm buttons or, you know, fill in the blank. And you're like, yeah, it's going to be totally black mirror. And, you know, as you were saying it, it occurred to me like that, that old saying of like shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. <laughs> right. If, if, because, you know, families that the, the founder had the absence, had to work, had to learn discipline, ingenuity, persistence, creates a fortune. The second one kind of takes it on. Maybe they're the scion. Maybe they don't bugger it up too much. By the time the grandkid gets it, he's got no awareness or perspective of where it came from and pisses it all away. And, you know, another example I always think of is like, you know, in, you know, having guided in Nepal and Tibet and that, that neck of the woods in the Himalayas was like, Oh, someone, a, Jap a Japanese hospitality firm was building a hotel near the Nepal base camp and creating a purely oxygenated, like 100% oxygenated thing so they could just fly in high net worth Japanese tourists to Everest base camp at 17, 18,000 feet and they wouldn't have to deal. But then you're like, oh shit. So like, you know, and then fly them up halfway up the mountain. They can take this, they can take their selfie. They can take the picture, but they're not acclimated. They don't know an ice axe from their asshole, you know, and if that helicopter, you know, if weather came in and they actually had to self-ambulate down, they'd be stuffed. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, that, that is a decent, you know, metaphor for our current psychedelic space, which is, yeah, you just glimpsed God consciousness and got the selfie, you know, but you couldn't survive a minute up there. Your lungs, your blood cells, your, your physiological capacity to hold that is zilch. And your awareness of the hazards and the dangers and the tools, equipment, practices, protocols, and, and communication to manage up in those kinds of places is, is non. So all you're doing is setting yourself up to be a liability or a hazard for the folks that are informed and are ethically obligated to look out for when other people come a cropper in that terrain. Yeah. I think that is a, a wonderful metaphor for it. That, 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 is that hotel still going? Just, you know, I, I read about it like five years ago. I'm going to have to go dig it up and see if it yeah. is still happening. Because you're curious. like, oh, stone me. Uh, really the key, I think, to preserving and maintaining multi-perspectival awareness and not getting seduced or snookered into the reality tunnel of your favorite choosing. You know, where you're the king or the queen and everybody, you know, and everybody revolves around your narrative, like always pop those bubbles. You know, we can keep popping those bubbles, right? Then we have a chance to, you know, it's just, you know, it's mountain stream. You damn it, it stagnates, it gets scum on the top. It was a beautiful stream. Right? It's still H2O molecules. It is what it is. But the moment we stop the thing from its natural course, we create stagnation. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And um, it just, there's a phrase that John Verbeke used at the, the beginning of lockdown um, that the, uh, our friend Peter Lindbergh at the Stoa has used a lot now, which is steal the culture. And it, you know, it strikes me that that, is, that has to come through the culture. That, that has to come through a, a shift in what psychedelic culture is. You know? And I think just thinking about it, that's my biggest yearning or one of my biggest yearnings in, in the space right now is you know, 
I sort of cut my teeth on listening to hours of Terence McKenna, you know, as in, in college and talking on psychedelic forums and I had a, like, did a psychedelic uh, visionary art podcast and just really delving into the culture. And it felt like this is my culture. And I've noticed the culture become quite disparate. And I would love to inject more of that uh, trickster energy into it and just, and just bring that back in some way. You know, I think there's a lot of, um, it's necessary and it has to come through culture. So Jamie, before we finish, is there anything we haven't covered that, that you think needs to be said? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to just kind of read a, a couple of paragraphs, which is the end of the chapter on sacraments. So, yeah, so if that, if that tracks, oh, yeah. um, and, and hopefully this is kind of also sums up and distills the conversation we've had over the last 20, 20, 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Right. right. Um, if ancient and recent history are any guide, even cautious moves towards legalizing these drugs could be reversed at the stroke of a pen. Prometheans run a distinct risk of getting their matches confiscated by the priests, all in the name of public safety. All it would take is an attorney general with a prosecutor's distrust of the weird or revolutionary, and decades of work could be frozen overnight. Open source means we have to share recipes made with widely accessible ingredients so communities everywhere have access. We can't afford to chase mad chemists or exotic plants and animals for our raw materiel. Anti-fragile, in this case, means resistant to persecution, especially if people start taking these liberating experiences seriously and start getting impatient for meaningful social change. The game then becomes how to diversify from an over-reliance on Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 substances that, however promising, are vulnerable to marginalization and interruptions in supply. When those rare or restricted compounds are available, therapists, scientists, and ministers can incorporate those more powerful tools into their ongoing work, like farm-to-table chefs featuring what's in season on their menus. In the meantime, we can pull together viable candidates from our unscheduled medicine cabinets and less restricted Schedule 3 and Schedule 4 compounds, that is, those available via prescription, like cannabinoids, nitrous and nitric oxides, carbogen, oxytocin, and ketamine. In other words, we need to create a list of widely available essential substances that grant inspiration, healing, and connection experiences that deliver us to the sublime with little more than a driver's license or a doctor's note. Church, then, could become something else altogether. Self-organized, synchronized consumption of prescription pharmaceuticals in a revelatory, celebratory environment. B-Y-O-E, bring your own entheogens, brought to you by your local Groove and Reconciliation Committee. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jamie. And thanks for the, the whole conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and always love rapping with you guys. And, uh, and then, then hopefully for anybody that was feeling a little under supported <laughs> as far as signposting fun and, and possible futures for us all to live into. Um, I sincerely hope that this, this, this second half, um, delivers on that. Yeah. Awesome.